office and I pass the Star Store and I can go pick up a pint of haagen on the way home. So the cue is the thought and the feeling, the routine is the picking up the haagen on the way home, the reward is the satiation of having what I wanted and having that in my belly and the taste and the feeling and all the senses associated with that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. What might be another one? Give me some other pattern that works for you that might be something you do that has, let's just pick a pattern, pick a habit. Glass of wine. Okay, a glass of wine. So what might be the cue that makes you want to have a glass of wine? The sense of just having a relief that a hard day is over with and it's a way to relax. Good. So do you have it in the middle of your day? No. Good. Do you have it um, in the space after work and before dinner? Yes. Oh, okay. So there's a timing aspect to that. Exactly. There's a time also if you had, are certain days more likely to give you the sense of <laughs> queuing of wanting the wine than another? Yes. Good. So maybe... The oh. busier I was and... Good. So lots of activity, busyness, yeah. kind of that sympathetic, kind of one of those kinds of days where your sympathetic yeah. nervous system is driving and you've worked hard and maybe not been as satisfying as certain other days. Okay. So... The combination of the timing and the feeling of the way the day made you feel is the cue for, oh, it's time that I get to give myself a glass of wine. So those are the different cues. The routine is getting myself a glass, pouring myself a glass of wine. <laughs> right? All those looking at the glass, tasting the glass, and all those are the rewards of, right? Exactly. Okay. Does everybody kind of understand that three-part system? Now. What marketers know very well, much better than we do, is how to establish the thing that really drives us to go from cue to reward, which means to develop a craving, okay? which can be very chemical, for example, like in cigarettes and in other substances that actually more easily create cravings. But they've also looked at a variety of other things of how do I increase this? So one of the examples that Charles gave that was very interesting in product design was Febreze. So it was a good story. Because when they were doing Febreze, anybody use Febreze here? Okay, so... I hate so. those commercials. Hmm? I hate those commercials. I hate those commercials. Oh. Okay. Well, I would never buy Febreze yeah. just because of those Well, $500 million <laughs> worth a year do. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. So what they found was when they were doing this Febreze, they actually found a chemical that took away odors. And I didn't know this, it, you know, because I always had thought of it as a perfumed smell. But when it began, it was really a chemical that was able to distinguish odors. And they looked at, wow, this is amazing. People that have dogs, people that have other kids, people that have things that smell in the house, we have something to take away those smells. Who's not going to want that? And they did a variety of tests, and it did not do well. In this beta testing, people did not want to use it much. And they just started to go, Why? This is crazy. This is an amazing thing, right? I mean, it sounds good at the beginning. And something really does what it says. And when they looked deeper, what they found was there was something about people really not wanting to admit to themselves that they had a smelly home. It wasn't very inspiring. It wasn't a very good driver to get a reward to now not have a smelly home. Not too exciting. When they started to review a lot of the different interviews with people, they found one woman that used it all the time, and they tried to look into that why. And for her, what it was, was when she finished cleaning the house, and the last thing that she did was she sprayed the sheets with some Febreze, that was like a, ta-da, it's done, it's a sense of completion, it's a sense of joy, like now it's done and perfect, and, and now I can just like kind of sit back and observe... And they said, wait a minute, that is a reward. A reward of completion, a reward of satisfaction, a reward of that I've done something well. It's like a pat on the back. And that was much more inspiring. And when they reworked their advertising campaign to advertise it that way, through the roof. And then they started to add different scents because of many people for look at the sale of candles and many other things that different smells and fragrances give people a sense of joy or relaxation 
And so they started to add a lot of scents. And then after a period of time, they were able to deliver a non-scented one because as people started to get used to it, they liked the getting rid of the old smell, and they were able to have non-scented ones. So when you look a lot at the different products, we need to realize how incredibly manipulated we are by this system. Do you think that the foam in shampoo does anything to make your hair cleaner? Do you think the foam in toothpaste or the menthol taste of toothpaste does anything? No, but it gives you a feeling. It gives you that minty clean feeling, that Listerol type feeling, that tingling. Of, it just is an irritant on your skin. And it gives you a sensation that you have learned to equate with something being cleaner. But it has nothing to do with it being cleaner or healthier. You've been totally had. <laughs> but they know it much better than we do. They understand how to create habits. It's their job to create profit for you to create a habit to buy their product. So they know this system way better than we do. Does that make sense? Blue doesn't work so well. There's a, a commercial commercial that'll, there's a chemical that'll take that off. <laughs> <laughs> Even better than saliva? <laughs> Nothing is better than saliva. <laughs> Can I ask a question? Yes, of course. Um, so, like, I'm a nail biter myself, and yes. so. I can never determine, I read that book, The Power of okay. Habit, and still trying to figure out, well, what is my reward? And I don't know if you're going to get into mm -hmm. that, but I just wanted to throw that out there. Like, I don't know what my reward is. Anymore. Okay, it's good. It's a habit that I do, but... Okay. Anyway. No, so the question is, and I can't answer that for you, but right. it's a really right. worthy question. Figure that out. Right? right? So what is that? And, and so that'll take me in a slightly different direction, but that's all right. What is the reward? Mm -hmm. Now, in Charles' book, a really good example, and I'll just use it for others for a moment, was what he says and what everybody will say is when you want to change a habit, the first step is observing that you're doing it. Mm -hmm. Wow, I noticed that I do this much more than I do. Try watching yourself on videotape. <coughs> oh my God, I had no idea that I did this like 30 times a minute. <laughs> right? So first we have to bring a sense of awareness to it. The next thing that we want to discover is what is the reward, right? Number one, well, what is the cue for doing it first? That's really important. And second is what is the reward? Because if we know what the cue is and we know what the reward is, then we can start to influence that middle section. So his example that was a good one was every mid-afternoon, somewhere between lunch and the end of work, he would walk up to the cafeteria and have a chocolate chip cookie. <clears throat> Anybody know that one? Something like that? Okay. So he said, okay, this probably isn't a good habit as his waistline started to grow. And he started to look at, okay, this is a habit I want to put some attention on and change, but I better figure out first what are the cues and what are the rewards. So the cue was the timing. That it was really somewhere about an hour, two hours after lunch, and so that, you know, he didn't go do that in the middle of the morning. And he didn't do it at 4.30, and, right? So, it was, so the time was his cue. But as he went upstairs to the cafeteria, he started to look at, well, what is the reward? Is the reward, reward stepping away from my desk and, getting, and taking a break? Is the reward getting some exercises because he had to walk up several flights to the cafeteria and maybe just getting some movement and exercise? That was really his reward. Maybe the reward was the cookie itself. Maybe the reward was being able to hang out with friends in the cafeteria. Well... I better do a little bit of experiment so I can tease out and figure out what is my reward for doing this. And so he started to, you know, like a little experiment. Okay, instead of doing that, I'm going to go for a walk outside. I'm going to just going to take a break. I'm going to take, um, I'm going to go visit some friends and not have a cookie. I'm going to go get something else instead of a cookie. And, and so he just started to play with all the variables. And what he found was that what was most important was taking that break from work and spending some socialization time with some friends with some other colleagues that he could just converse with and just be in a different state of mind with. And the excuse before was that he couldn't just do that because he wanted to do that. He had to go to, the, go to the cafeteria to get a cookie to do that. That was the convenient excuse that he used. And as far as he knew, he just wanted a cookie until he started bringing some awareness to his subconscious motivations. So 
one of the golden rules, according to Charles, is you want to save the queue, you want to save the reward, and you want to change the routine to something else. Now, okay. So with that, he started to look at, okay, the queue is the time. The reward is still coming back to my desk feeling better than I was before. The routine changed by what I'm doing to get to that reward. Okay? Now, what science has shown fairly strongly is that when we establish a habit, the neural network in our brain, all those neuron connections, for example, when we learn something new, up to about 2,600 neural connections happen in the brain from that learning something new. If we don't repeat it, we can lose at least half of those. Okay, so we're going to talk about the law of repetition and association. But with all that happening, especially done hundreds and thousands of times, we start to talk about something called Hebb's Law. Hebb's Law says nerves that fire together wire together. So they keep going, okay, I want this, I'm going to do this, I want this, I'm going to do this, then I do this. Pretty soon that starts happening. They start to develop these very enriched neural networks that are very, very strong. And what science has started to show, at least in some cases, is that we never lose it. That once we develop a habit pattern, it doesn't go away. What happens is that we develop a stronger habit that replaces it. But this is still in the background. So when they look at studies of, for example, alcoholics, and even if they've been clean and sober for 20 years, and they still then have a first drink, boom, all the receptors start refiring. Or they just get put in an environment where they used to drink, boom, all those receptors start firing again like they're still connected even though they haven't drank in 20 years. Now, what I will say is science has shown that. Do I believe that to be absolutely true? I actually don't. But I think it's a very strong thrust for most people. I do think, and I have seen personal evidence, that it is possible to literally rewire the brain so that that doesn't exist. But science hasn't quite shown that. But science really is also starting to look at, you know, in the last few years, people that have taken skillful mental training to exceptional levels. When you start to look at all the studies that have been done with longtime Buddhist meditators and monks for 20, 30 years, that's beyond normal person studies. You know, most research is being done on the average population, not on people that have spent exceptional amounts of time and years on focusing in mental rehearsal, etc. So I don't think that we can draw the conclusions of what's possible based on the generalized population. Because the generalized population does not consider mental skillful practice in the way that they consider physical exercise, for example, for most people. So I will say that there's the extraordinary. And so that's going to kind of, this is where I bridge the gap between Charles's work and uh, Dr. Dispenza's work, that this is really going to speak more to um, the extraordinary of what's possible. Okay. Okay. So another point that I want to talk about is what the, how are we doing so far? Good. Yeah? We right on target? We getting to information that's starting to get a little juicier and okay. How many people have read either of these? Just so I know, Power of Habit, at least one, two. Okay, great. Any Dr. Dispenza's work? One. Okay, great. So new material to expose you to new things, new book, new thought. That's great. Okay. So what does the brain do? Well, one thing you need to know is with our power of attention, in our conscious working memory. The human brain can really only hold on to about four things at any one time in its current active working memory. Monkeys, three to four. Humans, four, okay, is what they found. So if we can only really work with kind of four active ideas and concepts at a time, how do we possibly do all the things that we do? And it's called chunking. Everybody say chunking. Chunking. Good, and it's not Chinese noodles, right? So chunking is what happens is a way that the brain, everybody know what defragging is in the computer? Yes. Good, so defragging is kind of like this collapsing and condensing of material to kind of store that takes up less space. Perfect example for what the brain does with chunking. 
So the neuroscience of chunking is how do I like consolidate entire behaviors of things into smallest amount of information to be most